So we're going to start into now projectile motion, which I said was kind of our goal for the whole chapter. Right? Do you remember what type of motion projectile motion looks like? Yeah, like an arc. Good. So projectile motion is anything that moves through the air in two dimensions. So that means it's moving both in the x direction and the y direction at the same time. So it makes this rough kind of arc, not rough, it makes an exact arc pattern uh, that looks like this, right? It, it moves through the air at, in both the x direction and the y direction. Um, and so we're going to start with something called rolling projectiles. And rolling projectiles are things that leave some surface and roll off the edge and then fall to the ground, right? That's kind of where we're going to start, is that things leave some surface and they let gravity do the work. Right, But what I need you to understand is that we're going to get into a place where we look at something called launched projectiles. Those are the ones that go up and come back down. Right, So we're going to get through kind of a progression of these types of projectiles. But we said projectiles mean anytime we, we move through the air in two dimensions. So anytime we throw an object, we jump through the air, we kick something, those are all examples of projectile motion. All right. Um, with projectile motion, we need to understand that we don't really care about what put it into motion. You guys don't have to write every single part of this down, right? Just think through this or, or listen here. We're not really concerned about what's been, what's, what's happened beforehand that put it in motion, right? We don't really care about the motion of the kick itself. We just care about the object once it's been kicked, once it's moving through the air, um, in free fall or in free motion. So we only look at motion after it's been projected and it's moving freely through the air. So when we talk about projectile motion, we talk about things that are not, they're not connected to anything. It's not dropping from a string and going to catch. It's not connected to anything. It's moving freely through the air in two dimensions, okay, or two directions. When I say dimensions, I just mean x axes and y axes. Does that make sense? It's moving in the x and the y. Okay. So Galileo was the one that first accurately predicted projectile motion. Do you remember what else Galileo did? He talked about one other big concept. His um, first kind of thing that we looked at with him was gravity. He, he predicted that things would fall at the same rate regardless of their weight or of their mass. Right? He said that they're going to fall regardless of their mass at the same rate. So he also... Um, Describe projectile motion correctly first. And what he said here is really important. He, his understanding of projectile motion was that it has to be analyzed using vertical and horizontal components separately. That's super, super important. Okay? That pink makes it hard to read. but he, he first predicted that and really understood that. And that's a key for us doing projectile motion is that we have to analyze the vertical components separately from the horizontal components. They are independent of one another. I'm going to write that down because I think that's important. X and Y are independent of one another. Okay, so that means whatever the X is doing is really not affecting the Y variables. And whatever Y is doing is really not affecting the X variables. They are completely independent of one another. Okay, so now I want you to get thinking about your projectile motion equations. Right? Y final equals Y initial plus VIT, all that kind of stuff, right? VF equals VI plus AT. All of our kinematics equations now are going to be applied in the X direction and the Y direction. So we're going to have two kind of sets of equations, and I'm going to walk you through what those look like here in just a minute. But we do need to understand that now our motions are going to have to be analyzed completely separately. That's why we looked at our vector components, because now, for example, if I say an object is released at 3 meters per second at 20 degrees north of east, then we're going to be able to find out, well, what's its x velocity and what's its y velocity. Right? That's the whole point of us doing the vector addition first is because since our projectile motion has to be analyzed separately, we're going to have to find its horizontal velocity and its vertical, vertical velocity from this angle that we're given. Right? That was the whole point. All right, so in projectile motion, there's a couple kind of standards that we need to set or a couple uh, assumptions we need to make in order to make our problems a little easier for us. So we're always going to assume that air resistance is negligent. We're not going to 
um, count on air resistance as things move through the air, as we haven't previously, right? We've not talked about air resistance much at all. And in high school physics, we just don't, right? It's not something that we really pay too, too much attention to in solving our kinematics problems. So we're going to continue to assume that we can ignore air resistance, right? That's not going to affect our problem. Second thing that we want to assume, which is what we always do, is that time starts at zero. We don't care what happened to the object before it becomes a freely moving object. We just care about it in its projectile path, right? We do this for all of our problems. We always ass assume that time starts at zero. So this is not really a change for us. Last thing is that we want to assume that the motion begins at the origin, which means x sub i and y i are equal to zero. Right? That's how I've been working us through all of our problems anyway, is that our, our initial position is where our motion starts from. Okay, so let me give you an example of why that's important. Let's say that we have an object that rolls off a table. And it lands right over here, right? We've got it at this table right here. It rolls off the table. But instead of saying that our origin is at the ground, where it lands, we always want to say that our origin is where our motion starts from. So in this case, my horizontal position, my horizontal initial position, x, i, would be 0. But my x, f would be some positive number down here, right? Because it moved forward. Would we agree? And then my y initial position would be 0, but my y final would be some positive or some negative number. Some negative number because it's ending up below where it started, right? If we take this bigger picture into our coordinate system, this coordinate right here would be a positive then a negative, right? Does that make sense in the graphing coordinate system? All right, so that's what we're going to be looking at here. This is how we've solved all of our problems up to this point, but I wanted to kind of reiterate that. All right, let's look um, at an example here. This talking about a ball rolling off a table, I want you to just visualize that for a second, right? We had the object, it's going to roll off the table. Um, the origin set at the edge of the table, and we want to treat our horizontal and our vertical components completely separately, okay? So you don't have to write this example down. I just want you to, to listen through this, okay? If we're looking at the vertical components of this object, so here's my table, my object rolls off the edge. Here's my vertical components. At the very second that it leaves the table, my, first of all, my initial position would be zero. What would my initial vertical velocity be? The second that it leaves the table right here, is it moving in the vertical direction at all? No. So in this case, my VYI would be zero. Right? Because the instant it leaves the table, it's still moving horizontally until gravity can really start acting on it and making a difference on it. Right? Does that part make sense? The instant it leaves the table, it's still moving purely horizontally because during this portion of my motion, it's rolling along the table, rolling along the table, and the instant it leaves the table, it's moving horizontally. And then gravity starts acting on it and puts it in that archetype path. Right? But my initial vertical velocity would be zero. Okay, does that kind of make sense? Do you see where the subscripts came from and why they mean something? VI is something we're used to. We're used to initial velocity. The Y just tells me it's the vertical version of that. Okay, so we're going to start adding a bunch of these subscripts to it, but they mean something, right? Subscripts are these down here at the bottom. All right, so my vertical components, VYI equals zero, and then it will gradually increase as we start moving downward, right? It will start gaining speed as we move downward. My acceleration in the Y direction is always, always, always negative 9.8. Okay, always negative 9.8, um, just like our previous vertical problems. My y final and y initial are always going to be um, just based on the situation. Why y, y initial should always be zero, my y final we'll look at. Okay, horizontal components. Do, what do we know about, um, oh, I just put it up there, about horizontal acceleration? Do things accelerate in the horizontal direction? No. So ax, or acceleration in the horizontal direction, should always be zero, okay, because things don't just naturally speed up or slow down in the horizontal direction, right, it has to be caused by friction or air resistance, something like that, and in high school physics, we get to ignore that stuff, right, so as we're
we're looking at an object that's moving through the air like this, what do we know it does at this highest point right here? It stops moving, right? That's what we've kind of talked about with vertical problems. It stops and then it falls back down. But here's the issue with projectile motion. It doesn't really stop moving, but it does stop moving upward, right? Because if it stopped moving altogether, the path would look like this. But that's not really what happens, right? It continues to move horizontally and then it starts to move vertically again. So at this point, my VY is zero, but my VF is the same as it was here and the same as it was here because it's not speeding up or slowing down in the horizontal direction, okay? So what that means for us is that my initial horizontal velocity remains constant for the whole motion. So VXI, VXI would equal VXF, right? My final horizontal velocity and my initial horizontal velocity are the same because if there's no acceleration that means there's no change in velocity right for the horizontal direction so we're going to look at what that means in terms of our equations i'm going to give you a new set of equations specifically for projectile motion which will hit the ground first the ball that's rolled off the table or a ball that's dropped from the same height as the table what do you think if a ball that's rolled off the table like that or a ball that's dropped, which one will hit the, ball, hit the ground first? The dropped? How many of you think dropped? How many of you think rolled? How many of you don't know? Or is there another option? Same height. They will reach the, they will reach the ground at the same exact time. Why do you think that might be the case? Are they both falling from the same height? And vertical and horizontal have nothing to do with each other, right? So they're going to hit the ground at the same time. So Galileo predicted this. This is what it looks like frame by frame, right? These are like taken at one second intervals. And so, not one second, smaller than one second. But the object that's dropped gains its acceleration or gains its velocity at the exact same rate as the object that is rolled or that's horizontally projected. Because we said its horizontal motion has nothing to do with its vertical motion. So just because the yellow object is still moving in the horizontal direction, it's not affecting its vertical fall at all. Okay, so horizontal and vertical are going to be treated completely separately. So be, as long as these objects were dropped from the same height and they have roughly the same shape, which they do, um, they're going to hit the ground at the, exactly the same time. Okay. All right, now let's get our um, equations. So I'm going to give you equations just for projectile motion specifically. So there's going to be a set of vertical equations and a set of horizontal equations. So on your equation sheet, I would write projectiles and then write vertical, horizontal. And I'm just going to put them up here and then I'm going to show you where did they come from? How did we get them? Okay, but go ahead and write them down first. And then I'll kind of walk through how they came about. Okay, so I'll give you a few minutes here. All right, so with our projectile equations, we've got a set for vertical and a set for horizontal. And so if you look at where they come from, you can easily recognize this is our first kinematics, second kinematics, third kinematics equation, right? We can recognize that. And the only thing that's different here is that we've got y's plugged in, right? And so if we look at y final, that's the same, our final vertical position, y initial, initial vertical position. But the yi... That means initial velocity in the vertical direction, right? I need you to understand what the variables are telling us because they mean something, right? So VYI is initial velocity in the vertical direction. What does VYF then stand for? Perfect. Final velocity in the Y or the vertical direction, right? You can read it backwards if you want. Final vertical velocity. Right? If it helps you to read it that way, final vertical velocity. We don't have a, a subscript here on our acceleration. Why is that the case? Why do we just have A? And how do we know it's vertical? Still negative 9.8. And there's no acceleration in the horizontal direction. Right? We already said acceleration in the horizontal direction was zero. So there's no need to label it as X or Y because A equals negative 9.8, right? All right, 
second set of equations, they come from a little bit, um, they come from the same set, but I want to show you how we got here, right? There's significantly fewer horizontal equations. And this one, all it does is tell us that our initial horizontal velocity and our final horizontal velocity are the same, right? It doesn't even give us anything to solve for. It just tells us that these two are equal. So here's where they come from. This is our first kinematics equation with the x variables. V, um, Vx, F equals Vxi plus Ax times T. But what did we say that Ax was equal to? What did we say horizontal acceleration was equal to? Zero. Right? So that drops that whole term out. So that's where this equation comes from. Right? Vx, F equals Vxi. The second kinematics equation would look like this. X final equals X initial plus VXI times T plus one half AXT squared. What do we know about AX? It's zero. So that drops this whole term out, which is where this equation comes from. Okay? The third one would look like this, Vxf squared equals Vxi, oops, i squared plus 2ax times x final minus x initial. And what do we know about ax? It's zero, so it drops that whole term out. So is there a reason to have Vx squared equals Vi squared if we have this already? All right, there's no reason for that. So the, the reason we only have two horizontal equations, because, because we don't have acceleration in the horizontal direction, it removes a bunch of, of issues from our problems, right? What's the one variable that allows you to kind of cross over between the two sets of equations? What's the one variable that is shared in these two equations? Time, right? Time is the only thing that can keep us consistent or keep us connected between these two sets of equations, right? We can solve for time using vertical equations and then go apply that time to solve for a horizontal variable, right? Time is the only thing that overlaps between the two sections, the, between the two differences in equations. So that's something that we really are going to have to pay attention to is that let's say the problem gave us, let's say it gave us this, this, uh, I don't know, one other, this one, and yet we wanted to solve for x final, right? We would have to solve for t out of one of these equations and then go down and plug it in right there, right? We have to make sure that we're going to be able to cross over or use both sets of equations to get to what we want to get to. But time is really the one that allows us to make that kind of crossover, okay? It's the only variable that's shared between the two sets of equations. So I need you to understand for now, going forward the rest of this chapter, we're not going to use our regular kinematics equations. We're going to use our projectile sets of equations because we're going to analyze vertical and horizontal motion completely separately. Okay. Um, we're not going to jump in on this one just yet. We'll start with this problem tomorrow. Uh, but, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Okay? So we'll start with this problem tomorrow.